Thank you for joining us for Church Online this morning. As you can see, I've got Crystal and Shay with me here today. So they're going to be facilitating with me. And to introduce um, them to you, um, I thought I'd ask them a question to start with that they don't know what it is. So um, the question that I have for you this morning is, Shay and Crystal, when you were growing up, who was your childhood a famous crush a famous person that you had a crush on as a kid that's easy Leonardo DiCaprio oh nice I actually have a story I know this about you not about me but I've got a story about Leonardo DiCaprio so I watched <laughs> I watched Blood Diamond um, knowing that he was in it right but then I in my head I was thinking of what's that guy from Pirates of the Caribbean Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. I thought Leonardo DiCaprio was Johnny Depp. No. So the whole movie, I was waiting for Johnny Depp to show up on screen, and he never did. And I was very confused. Then afterwards, I Googled. Turns out that's Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> not Johnny Depp. Anyway, this is about you, Crystal. Sorry. That's so okay. Sorry. that's okay. <laughs> was it just after watching one of his movies? Um, it was definitely the Titanic. I watched yeah. it a number of times at the cinema, and um, I just immigrated from uh, South Africa to New Zealand. And I think I was feeling really vulnerable as it was, but yeah. I clung on to this poster in my bedroom, and it was of Leo, you know. And nice. I remember sitting on the floor of my bedroom looking up and just crying because. <laughs> Yeah, I was just so, yeah. what I thought was, <laughs> in crush. Man, back nice. in the day when you'd buy magazines and tear out the posters of your <laughs> favourite crushes. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's a great story. What about you, Shay? Mine was, um, so many people don't know who I'm talking about when I say it, but it was, um, he was from the band called Hanson. Okay. And they're a group of band of brothers and his name was Zach and he was the drummer. And he was like very cute for a teenage nice. girl. Yeah, I mean he's a boy, but teenage girl. Yeah, crush. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is where we need a little photo on the screen to show us what it looks like. I know Henson well. Yes, because at the same time that I was crushing on Leo, <laughs> my one of my best friends, she had a crush on Zach from Hanson. Oh, so see? I'd walk into her bedroom and the ceiling, the walls, the floor, everywhere you look, there were posters of Zach. So wow. They yeah. um, did that song, Imbop. I don't think mm, I Okay, he doesn't know the song. Bop, that's the one. That's awesome. <laughs> Crystal, I never knew you had it in you. She's going to join the worship team. Nice, I like it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you guys for sharing. Um, this is Crystal and Shay, so ask them about their childhood crush. If you shared the crush, um, that's a point of conversation for you guys, clearly. Um, but thanks for joining us this morning. You can sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. We're so glad you could join us for Church Online this morning. We're going to sing a really awesome song that reminds us that God is greater than anything we could ever possibly comprehend. So let's raise our voices and praise Him.
The song we're about to sing is called Oh Come to the Altar. And I think it's a brilliant reminder that whatever our past may look like, whatever we've done in our lives, we can still come to the altar of God. Um, and he doesn't shun us away. He's always there for us and he always wants us to come and see him. So as we sing this song, we can reflect on the goodness of God and we can reflect and just come to his altar, lay everything before him and just praise him in this. is a real 
If you joined us last week, you'll know that we are currently in our series called Something New. And last week, we shared with us about something new that God wants to do in community. This week, we're going to carry on with this topic of something new, but look at it in another area of our daily lives. So, to start us off today, I am going to give you guys a question, let you know a special word, and I want you to think, what is the first thing that comes to your head when you think of the word health? Take a moment, think about it. You can chat to your friend if you want. But as we get into today, maybe you're a little bit like me. And the first thing that you think of when you hear the word health is fitness. Now, fitness is often used synonymously with the word health. They kind of go together, right? Health and fitness. So maybe you're sitting there already getting excited, getting pumped, thinking about your next workout that you've got planned. Maybe though you're rather cringing and shrinking back in your seat, thinking about the last time that someone forced you to work out, the chest burning, muscles aching, sweat pouring off you, and the dreaded B word, burpees. Maybe for you, when you think of health, you actually think about food and diet and maybe you're thinking now about salads and celery and green smoothies and lemon drops in your water every morning and all these things that oh maybe you should be doing 
or maybe rather you think about the mental side of health about mindfulness or mental health maybe illness or depression stress anxiety or that feeling of burnout and overwhelm these are all part of health as well or maybe the word health brings up fear or memories or experiences of illness and sickness and disease that maybe you or someone close to you has experienced maybe even right now you find yourself in a season of suffering with your health and so the next question and what our topic for today is going to be is what is something new that God wants to do in your health Maybe already that has given you this tentative feeling of hopefulness that, hey, maybe this is going to be my season of healing from, from that disease or that illness or the sickness. Maybe you're thinking, actually, this is going to be my, my time for something new, for, for finding relief from the negative thoughts and feelings that I've actually been battling with in my own head. Or maybe you're just thinking about that extra 10 kg that you could shed before next summer and emerge into the wild with a new sense of self-confidence and washboard abs. Maybe you're just thinking, hey, I would love to feel not as tired anymore. Whatever it is, today we are going to discover what the something new is that God wants to do in your health. So let's start today by exploring this word health. What does it really mean? And let's define the context that we're gonna use it for the rest of today's message. Don't fear though, there won't be any burpees in the making of this message today. More and more we see and hear in our society that there actually is the research and the understanding that health really is more than just what's happening with our physical bodies, but rather it is this holistic process that includes our mind, our emotions, our mental health and even our spiritual well-being. Now if you aren't quite sure what the word holistic means then don't worry you're not alone because as I was writing this message I asked Blair what he thought it meant and his description was something to do with hippie grass tea. Not sure where he got that from but that's not the version of holistic health that we're speaking of today. However when we speak about holistic health we're speaking about our mental physical and emotional health all wrapped up into this one interconnected whole. Now the World Health Organization even defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. Our connection with those around us, our social well-being is even defined by the I guess authorities in health as being part of what makes us healthy or not. You might also be familiar with the concept of te whare tapafa, which is the Māori health model that's founded on the same principles of physical, mental, spiritual and family health. As Christians, we believe that our spiritual wellness makes up a big part of our well-being and our connection to God and our lived purpose within the framework of our faith. So we're going to continue today by actually looking at a couple of different verses in the Bible and seeing what God has to say about our health and how that relates to our relationship with him and how it relates to us living out our faith in our daily lives. The first verse that we're going to look at is actually found in Matthew and these are the words of Jesus himself speaking. This is what it says in Matthew 22, 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, whenever I've read this in the past, I've really, I guess, thought of the word soul in that context to mean our spiritual kind of side in this almost intangible, subconscious, spiritual, deep connection or something. And even when I googled it, the Merriam-Webster dictionary describes the soul as the spiritual principle embodied in human beings, or God sense. And I do love this description. However, as I did a little more research, I actually discovered that in the original Hebrew and then later the Greek, 
that the Bible was written in, the word soul was rather used as something to just describe the physical living human body. Think of it in terms of a ship out at sea where a captain might say we've got 110 souls on board. Now he doesn't mean we've got 110 spiritual principles on board but rather 110 living bodies or people or lives on board. And that's exactly what it means here when we see Jesus speaking. I feel it's safe to say that we truly are being asked by Jesus to love God with all of our mind, heart and physical bodies. And remember, there's the most important part of that verse as well at the end where it says, actually, this is the first and the greatest commandment. So why is this important for us to know? And what does it even look like to truly love God with our mind, our heart and our body? This leads us into our next verse, which is a passage found in Romans chapter 12, where the writer is actually kind of instructing us and encouraging us on the how. This is what it says. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Here we see especially this, I guess, physical day-to-day, -day, daily life aspect highlighted of how we worship and how we embrace what God does for us. And this is by placing every moment before him as an offering. Now, I know the word offering can kind of sound like a big and intimidating word, but it does point us towards sacrifice. And a word that I like to use instead of sacrifice is this word surrender. How can we surrender each moment of each day back to God? Maybe this could look like something simple, like when we sit down to eat a meal, we actually stop and say thanks or say grace and acknowledge God's provision in our life. Maybe it could look like asking God for opportunities to show up in a really real way for someone that maybe you know is struggling at the moment. Or maybe it could just be praying and dedicating your workout to God before you head to the gym. It doesn't have to be something big and fancy and intimidating, but just a simple way of inviting God into our everyday moments. The common thread here is surrender. The common thread is not making it about ourselves, but rather what the last verse, the last part of the verse says, it's about embracing what God has done for you. I love the imagery in that, embracing what God has done for you. It's another reminder that actually there's nothing that we have to do or that we even can do to earn the love of God. It's a reminder that he has already laid down the ultimate sacrifice through his son, Jesus, to take our place and in turn gift us a life of freedom. And all we need to do is embrace it. Imagine how our perspective might change, how our sense of each daily task might be ignited when we continuously surrender it to God. Imagine how much more aware of his presence we might become if we stopped to surrender each moment back to him every day. If we really stop and reflect and embrace what God has done for us, imagine the little sparks of something new that we might find lighting up each moment of our daily lives. But then, this is easier said than done, right? Taking these times out and even just remembering to stop and surrender to God. I don't know what it is for you, but often there's always going to be something that tries to get in the way and tries to stop us from doing that. And I think for many of us, this can simply be the busyness of life. I don't know about for you, but I know for me, busyness is even the same thing that tends to affect my health. Just too busy to eat right or to exercise or to get a good night's sleep or to actually take care of my mental health. 
I don't know if you've seen those state insurance ads, but if you have, I'm sure you can relate. They describe, I guess, someone's daily life and starting with the morning and feeling like you're running late, rushing out of the house, stuck in traffic, and then you realize you've actually left the iron on back at home and now the house is burning down. Or you left the bathroom tap on and the rooms are getting flooded. And it always at finishes with this little saying, state, insurance for two busy lives. Now, the ads themselves are pretty humorous, but I don't know about you, I can definitely relate to them. It feels like every day is rushing from this to that, and if you can hardly remember to turn off the iron or the bathroom tap or you've forgotten what day it is, how are we supposed to stop to remember to actually surrender and embrace what God is doing for us in each and every moment. In his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer, the writer, describes this very same phenomenon and he says this, so many people live without a sense of God's presence throughout the day, but could it be, with a few exceptions, we are the ones who are absent, not God. We sit around sucked into our phones or TV or to-do lists, oblivious to the God who is around us, with us, in us, and even more desiring than we are for relationship. I don't know about you, but I can relate to this quote a thousand times over. I spend my moments sucked into the busyness of life, trying to squeeze the most out of every day that I can from the minute that I wake up in the morning to the minute that I collapse back into bed in the evening. Everything is so busy and hurried and rushed that how are we supposed to remember to squeeze that time in for God every day? And then gets to the end of the day and we're the ones thinking, where is God when really we're the ones who haven't been making space for him? Now, I'm not saying that we all need to take three hours out of every morning and commit that to spending time praying and reading the Bible and connecting with God. I mean, if you've got the capacity in your life to be able to do that, then amazing, do it. We need people like that in the world, I'm sure. However, if you're anything like me or anything like a lot of us, I think, finding time is always the tricky thing. So how can we do something new in order to make it a priority to stop, to surrender and to embrace what God is doing for us and his presence in our lives. Maybe we need to stop and reflect on why. Why are we so busy and why are we so drained mentally, emotionally, physically and spiritually so that it stops us from prioritizing growing in our faith. I know that a lot of us often don't have the time to stop and reflect on what's really important to us. And it's said that it actually takes one of four things to happen in our lives to make us stop and reflect. Death, divorce, disease, or redundancy. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be stopped and waiting for one of those things to happen before I really take the time to stop and reflect and ask what's really important to me. Am I really living out the purpose that God has placed on my life? Are all the things that are squeezed into your life, all the things that are filling up your day, propelling you towards the purpose that God has called you for? We often speak about how each one of us are given different gifts and talents and roles and jobs that are uniquely for us, that God has called us to. And that actually these don't have to be fancy or seemingly important or within the church to actually make a difference for God's kingdom. Rather, we know that whatever we do, like in the Romans verse, we're actually doing it each moment surrendering and embracing God within that. Whether that is making your children's lunches or running a corporate meeting, doing your workout at the gym or even investing in your recovery. And here's where we see the real need for health and well-being in our lives. And that's to be able to fully live out our God-given purpose. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20, it says this, 
don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Our bodies are the home of God and the vehicle for his purpose in our lives. And they're the only ones that we get. I think when God inspired his writer to include this verse in the Bible, he knew that through our health kind of failing and not really doing well, it's the way that our relationships with others suffer, our mental health suffers, that we doubt ourselves, and that it begins to affect our relationship with God. If we are living these two busy lives that are stealing our energy, our vitality, our wellness, our health, or even corrupting our idea of beauty and acceptance, then how much more are they stealing from our influence and our purpose for God? Whether it's that we're too busy to not eat well or not care about our fitness, maybe to not sleep enough at night or to just live a sedentary life or isolate ourselves, even to continue with negative self-talk in our head or maybe even self-destructive behaviours. We're instructed that our body is actually the place and the home and that it belongs to God. He is in us and we are His. I also believe that there's this trap we can fall into here if we take this verse kind of out of context where rather than placing the emphasis on honoring and worshiping God with our bodies, we can start to just worship our bodies. That the emphasis can become on what we put into our body or how much we train and what we get out of our body. Maybe we can be a little bit too self-indulgent with our self-care routines and stop connecting with others because we need to take care of ourselves. We don't want to confuse worshipping God with worshipping our body. What it really comes down to is that the emphasis is still and needs to always be on God, not on creating or sculpting or being the perfect person or the perfect body or who others believe that we should be. We know we're in trouble when our health begins to hold more weight and space in our mind and heart than our relationship with God does. It's not about being perfect or being like anyone else or who our society, our culture or our peers tell us that we should be. In fact, it's not about you, full stop. It's about looking outwards and allowing ourselves to be used by God and for his purpose. So, how do we apply this? How does honouring God with our body without being defined by our body really look? And how does surrendering our everyday ordinary moments to God look without cutting out the necessary and often good things that fill up our daily lives? Now I don't actually think that we can answer these questions right now in this talk but that maybe we need to continue to reflect on these and come back to them throughout the series and even throughout the rest of this year. But I do want to finish off today with one idea and two really simple action steps that I believe can help us in our pursuit to find or do or create something new in our health. Now this idea is called a means to an end. Now you may have heard this phrase before. A means to an end is simply speaking about an activity or a process that is gearing you or pointing you towards an end goal. The means part is not really where the focus or the value lies, but it is rather just a stepping stone to get you to the end. The first thing that we need to do is figure out what our end is. Take the time to reflect. What is your end goal in life? Pretty big question, right? But don't we want to know the answer to it before we go on living out the rest of our life? If you're a sold out follower of Jesus, then your answer might be something along the lines of to share the love and saving grace of Jesus with those around me. And in fact, that's actually part of our Grace Gate 
mission statement. Maybe your end goal might be to become more like Jesus or to glorify God in all that I do. Maybe your end might include your family or various values that you hold really close to your heart. Whatever it is, let's take the time to define it, to think about it, to write it down, maybe even to share it with someone else. So that's step number one. And step number two is to define the means, to define the action steps or maybe the process that's going to help you get towards the end goal. Now today, our means are going to be something specifically to do with our health, our mind, our heart or our body. To help you out and to give you a bit of an example for this, I thought I'll be vulnerable and share with you what mine would be for today. So my end, my end goal is and has been for a while for me to use my gifts and my passions to share the love and hope of Jesus with everyone that I meet. Now the means to match that I thought today I'm going to focus on the physical aspect so on my body. My passions are all pretty much active or physically based and so realistically in order for me to do them to the best of my ability and for that to be sustainable I probably should be focusing on my physical fitness and keeping my body healthy and able to move as well as fueling my body with really good sources of energy and even foods that could help to aid in my muscle recovery. Now I've not been doing this very well lately and because of my too busy life have been rather not working out and choosing to eat takeaways at the end of the day rather than to cook fresh because it's just easier. However the big part of this action step is actually to always keep the end in mind. The end that actually I'm not doing this to have some kind of perfect body or healthy lifestyle and it's not about me or how I perform or how I look but rather this is about me being able to live out and accomplish to the best of my ability the purpose that God has given me in my life. Now in the book that I mentioned earlier, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, the author John Mark Comer describes a story that speaks about his version of a means to an end and it goes a little bit like this. He tells of his neighbours that he sees every morning as he sits inside drinking his coffee. These neighbours file out of their flat, there's about six of them, young, fit, in their twenties kind of people and he says they come out every morning in their lycra ready to do their morning run. Now when they do this, they do this every day without fail, whether it's in the humid heat of summer or the icy freezing cold of winter. And when they run, they don't just run, they train. They push their bodies to the limits so that they can break the muscle down and they can come back stronger and fitter and more resilient the next day. Their whole lifestyle is geared towards running. They go to bed at 8 p.m. every evening after eating their celery mainly for dinner and they have ice baths and they decline any invitations to go on social outings if it's going to interfere with their strict schedule. Now as John Mark writes he describes witnessing these neighbours and wishing that he had their dedication, wishing that he was as strong and as fit as they were when he did his runs, wishing that maybe he even looked as good in lycra as they did. But what he realises is that as much as he wants that, their end goal is very different to his end goal. Their end goal is based on the performance of their running and that's what every step and every action of their day is geared towards. However, for John Mark, he says that actually his end is to become more like Jesus. And so when he goes for runs, he goes for a run to be able to have the time just to think and to kind of zone out. He goes for a run to be able to actually connect with God. And he runs to know that he's fit enough and mobile enough to keep up with his own children as they continue to grow older. His end is to become more like Jesus in everything.
in his parenting, in his work life, in his hobbies, in his relationship with his wife and in his friendships. You see, maybe there's something new that God wants to do in your health this year is for you to take up walking or running or join a fitness class or maybe to choose those fresher options instead of the takeaways every night, Brie. And it will be in the process of your health improving where God really shows up for you, where you feel his presence and where you're able to sense him more. Maybe your something new is to reassess your end goal and to actually cut back on that strict limiting diet or the regimented training that you're putting your body through every day. Maybe it's time to realize that the way you look or your performance or the number of reps that you can produce doesn't define who you are and that God wants to show you that there's more to you than how you look on the outside or what you can do. Maybe something new looks like putting aside your fear or pride or shame and talking to a friend or booking in to see a counsellor and just sharing that, hey, actually, I'm not doing well. I'm battling with these thoughts and fears going on in my mind and my heart every single day and I need some help. Or maybe something new looks like discovering that actually you have a purpose and that there is a plan for you despite the health struggles that you're currently going through. Despite all of the changes you've tried to make in your health that haven't really made a difference, God wants to show you that there is something new for you and that he's still going to use you and bless you in this season. There's something new that God wants to do in your life can come through simply surrendering each moment, each task, each job, each routine, meal, plan, fear and worry to him and allowing him to do something new in your life. By setting these action steps or these means and focusing on Jesus as the end goal, we're already combining our mind, our heart and our body in this holistic process and approaching our health from a place of honour and offering to God. So today I want to challenge you to figure out for you what is that end and what are the means that goes along with it and to continue embracing God in every step of the way. And like we shared last week, let's actually get together and be vulnerable with each other, connect and hold one another accountable to whatever our means to an end is. Let's open our eyes and our heart to really see what God is going to do, what the something new is that he's going to do in our health this year. Let's pray. Lord God, we just want to start today by thanking you and praising you for these bodies that you've given us, the minds that you've blessed us with and the hearts that you've gifted us that are able to connect and be open with one another. I just pray that um, as we reflect and look at our why and set our, our end goal in life that actually we'll be able to, to meet with you there and that you'll be with us in that process and you'll lead us and inspire us as we set new goals within our health. We pray for your blessing over all of the lives that are here listening today that you will just bring the most healthy and prosperous times of our life and that this year we will experience something new and that we will meet with you in a more real and tangible way than ever before. Amen. We hope that you were challenged and inspired by what Bree shared this morning. And just to follow on from that, um, we've still got Shay and Crystal here with us. Um, and we thought we'd just ask some of their thoughts and where the message kind of landed for them. Um, so Shay, Crystal, was there anything that Bree shared that kind of resonated with you where you're at? Yeah, Walter, for me, it's um, the part that stood out for me was Te Whare Tapafa. Um, it's the Māori model of health uh, and the importance of, you know, those four walls being balanced throughout my life. Um, the spiritual, the mental, um, the... Physical. Physical. Family. And 
<laughs> physical and the family yeah. and, and how all four of those components are important without yeah. one um, you know the house may be on shaky ground without two even shakier so it's really important to ensure that those walls are standing up and standing up strong um, and awesome. continue to build on those foundations and um, yeah yeah that's awesome thank you I think for me, um, there was a quote that Bree shared. Sorry, guys, unlock my phone. But it was by John Mark Cromer from the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he says that so many people live without a sense of God's presence through the day. But could it be, with a few exceptions, that we're the ones who are absent, not God? Yeah. And it makes, makes me sit there and think about, like, how many times do I sit down to eat my dinner or my takeaways or my scone or whatever I've got and actually thank God for the food that's in front yeah. of me? Or for the money that's in my bank account to be able to go and buy my coffee. Mm. Or for the kind words that Crystal just spoke to me just before we started recording. Mm. You know, like how often am I thanking God, praising God, um, or just giving Him the gratitude for the things that, the everyday parts yeah. of life that we live. I love that. Um, yeah. So that. Yeah, yeah. So so let me ask you this then. How do you think we, we do the more of that we kind of, like you, you just mentioned about the soul, how we how we kind of allow God's presence to infiltrate every area of our life. I think um, a big part of that is the word that you just said, soul. Yeah. And there's the verse that Bree shared earlier, which said, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Mm. And we often um, misattribute perhaps the what soul actually is and we don't remember that soul is every component of yeah. us it's our mind it's our body it's our heart it's our health it's everything yeah. um and i think once we're aware of that and once we know that i think it becomes a little bit easier to see god in those uh, god's presence awesome. in the moments of everyday life because you're grateful for what you have you're grateful for what you do and for yeah. what he's provided love that awesome um crystal you mentioned about and, and you've studied this you're quite an expert on kind of the fari tapafa and and you do this in your daily life how how does what shay just shared kind of about the soul for you how do how do god almost become a bigger part of your life or maybe your awareness of god increases by implementing some of these things i think um you know when when taking the actions and, and actually working through uh those areas of your life that are lacking it's important to um work in conjunction with God, you know, and to hand that stuff over on a daily basis. I know for me, um, when I wake up in the morning, I need to surrender. I need to surrender um, all of that stuff, mm. you know, and really pray for guidance as to where, which areas of my life do need strengthening. Um, yeah, I, I love that word surrender. You know, it's been instrumental in my life and in my own uh, journey of healing. Um, and it's not just about creating a space, you know, and in that moment surrendering. Um, mm. It's surrendering all day long, you know, because sometimes you can just you carry on your, going about your day and you just got to keep surrendering, you know, keep handing that stuff over. Um, there's nothing that my God cannot do. Awesome. And um, I know that... That that's where I get my power from, and that's yeah. where I get my strength from. It's a never-ending source of um, just, yeah. That's incredible. Power for me. I love that. Love that. Um, so the last question I want to ask follows on perfectly from that, um, and this is kind of for you personally, making it a bit more personal. Um, you use the word surrender. Bree used the word surrender. Um, what's maybe an area of your life that you've been challenged this morning to surrender to God? Um, in pursuit of this new that God wants to do in your health especially? Um, I think for me, and, and this is an ongoing journey, you know, it's really important that I remain vigilant with my mental health, you know, that I continue to work on that stuff and identify different areas and in, in, um, whether it's with my emotions, you know, to continuously keep checking in with where I am, what mm. I'm feeling. Um, and, you know, and handing that, there's sometimes those really uncomfortable feelings over, again, surrendering that stuff to God and, um, you know, really challenging my thought processes mm. that go on. Um, I mean, my head is always thinking and, you know, I can change the trajectory of my thoughts just by, <laughs> sorry, I can change <laughs> I feel like we need to explain the trajectory. <laughs> we, we had a laugh about this because we all struggled to say the word trajectory. <laughs> so anyway, I can change the direction of awesome. my thoughts um, just with a prayer, you yeah. know, and that's 
pretty amazing like it may not happen straight away but it will happen and um just being aware of where I'm at mentally is so important for me because I know without my mental health um you know my physical health will suffer yeah. and um my spiritual health will suffer like or and my family life will, will mm. most certainly suffer mm. like you know so that for me is, is a pillar of awesome of my wellness love that yeah. thanks crystal that's so good. I don't quite know how to follow that, but I think um, to a certain degree, I feel like I'm fairly similar to Crystal in the way that my mind is a constant, um, I guess it works constantly. It's yeah. always overthinking. Yeah. Um, it's always telling me lies. Yeah. And I think that sounds really bad, but you know, we often have things ingrained in us. I don't yeah. speak kind words to myself. Um, mm. I think it's at the point now where it's like, I'm aware of it, but what's the next step? Awesome. And so it's no longer just about awareness. It's about knowing that, hey, like, Yep, I'm experiencing this, God, I'm thinking this, but I know that's not what you say about me, and yeah. I know that's not what you believe about me, and I know that's not what you want from me. Love um, so now I'm going to say, you know, hand it over to you and leave it with you. So it really is yeah. just it's the surrender thing again. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. Thank you both for sharing your wisdom um, and, and being willing to be vulnerable to share your journey with us as well. Um, and, and thank you guys for joining us this morning. Um, we want to encourage you to have these sorts of conversations um, in your bubble and your family. Um, and, and I love what Shay shared at the end, um, how we can maybe take that next step that go from knowing these things to actually put it in, putting it into practice as well. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, Please, um, as well, we just want to let you know as well that um, as a community, um, we really want to be here for you and we are here for you. And so if maybe you're struggling during this time emotionally, um, maybe you're isolating at home and you're feeling um, like you are lonely or you need some practical support or groceries or whatever it is, please, 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 please get in touch. We would love to be there for you and support in whatever way we can uh, during this time, especially. And then with regards to life groups, um, please check our websites as well, um, or you can get in touch with your life group leaders as well. They will have more information about your specific life group, whether or not it is meeting at this stage. Um, so please check out the website, get in touch with your life group leader, um, and we hope to see you very soon.